Hi, I'm Rena Bell DeMillo. Welcome to Asian American Life. We're kicking off our summer show right here at the Cranford Rose Garden at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. What better way to spend a summer day? Coming up on our show, we take a look at trends in music, food, and social media. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook for more. And now, here's a look at what's ahead. All that jazz, Kyung Yoon meets rising star Grace Kelly. Hospitality across America, Minnie Rowe reports on Indian American owned hotels and motels. Pokey, Paul Lynn fishes for answers on the latest food craze. Plus the art of the meal, food bloggers tell all. This and more on Asian American Life. I'm Kyung Yoon at the Cutting Room in New York City with the saxophonist, composer and singer Grace Kelly. She's being hailed as a new face of jazz. With her aqua streaked hair and Asian ethnicity, Grace Kelly is not your typical jazz standard. There's so many things about my name and the way I look. Being a, a woman and Asian American and playing this instrument saxophone and jazz is, is very unusual. But the 25-year-old music sensation says when it comes to jazz, all that really matters is whether or not you've got the chops. I've been extremely lucky that I've had mentors in this music, like the alto great Phil Woods, who played with Dizzy Gillespie and was in Quincy Jones' band, Lee Konitz, who was in Miles Davis's No Net, you know, Wynton Marsalis, Harry Connick Jr., who have taken me under their wing and had me play with them, uh, Frank Morgan's another, and never judged me on how I looked or said, oh, no, she, she can't join us because she doesn't look like us. So I'm grateful for those mentors and, and the community that, um, the community is kind of like, hey, if you can play, you can play, you know, if you're making great music. The past year has been an especially exciting one for Kelly, having been a regular on Stephen Colbert's Late Show Band and releasing her 10th CD, which got voted number two jazz album of 2016 by Downbeat Magazine. She's come a long way since first picking up the saxophone when she was 10 years old. I fell in love with it instantly. I had my first performance at Borders Books six weeks after I started playing and I was playing these jazz standards. And I was so small at the time that I had to put my case out, sit on my case and put a pillow in front and play sitting down. She went on to record her first album at the age of 12, performed as a teenager at President Obama's inauguration and has toured more than 30 countries as a band leader. Born as Grace Chung in Wellesley, Massachusetts, Kelly adopted her stepfather's Irish surname when she was eight years old. My parents played a lot of the tenor saxophone of Stan Getz when I was growing up. And these great Brazilian songs, you know, Joe Beam, Girl from Ipanema, and Stan Getz would play on these songs. And I just grew up with these recordings and loving the sound that he would make from the saxophone. So I think in my head, I always knew I love the saxophone. She also grew up singing and making up her own songs, here belting out her first composition when she was seven years old. On my way home, looking for someone. My mom, she said, as soon as you could talk, you were singing. And I was a huge Broadway lover. I mean, my parents would take myself and my sister to New York City every year, two times a year, and we'd see these incredible Broadway shows. What were some of your favorite shows? My favorite was Thoroughly Modern Millie, and Sutton Foster was the lead, and I knew the whole soundtrack. We actually went to see it twice. Even as she charts her own professional journey, Kelly finds time to give back through her talents. She donated the proceeds of a song she wrote called She's the First to support scholarships for girls around the world who are the first in their families to get an education. The catchy tune is catching on. She is the first to dance her mark, first to rise, start a spark. And it's been a beautiful thing to see how music, and particularly a song, can be such a personal thing, bring people together, and in this case, 
for young women around the globe who might need that support. Luckily, they've been able to get it financially, but also mentally, like the song brings something out of them and, and helps them get to school every day or gives them a beat to walk to. So it's, it's been really a beautiful thing. And Kelly says she's been surprised to find out that she's a role model to so many young women and girls. I met a, a girl the other day. I was having brunch with my friend and I was in line for the bathroom and she came up to me and she said, are you Grace Kelly? And I was like, yeah, I didn't have my sax or anything. And she's Asian American and she said, I'm your biggest fan. I'm visiting from Seattle. And she's like, I can't, can I take a selfie? And she said, you know, my sax one teacher told me to look you up and there's not like many other female uh, Asian American women who are playing the saxophone, I really look up to you. Kelly is also innovating to bring jazz to a younger audience. She recently launched a video pop-up series on social media that's already garnered more than a million views. Basically, I take my horn and wherever I'm traveling, I'll find like a really fun, fun thing to do. And it's my way of trying to bring my music and jazz and the horn like to places and audiences where you wouldn't expect it and for it to be this approachable thing. But I think it's important as a young artist to be like merging traditional media with, you know, social media and, and just trying to, to make this music presented to, to everybody. Grace Kelly is producing two web series as well as writing her 11th album. Plus, she's working on an electronic dance music project. All this while keeping up a demanding touring schedule. It's clear that we'll be hearing from this talented young musician across many platforms. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rowe. If your summer plans involve traveling the United States and staying at a hotel, chances are the place you stay may be owned and operated by Indian Americans. But the reason behind how and why the Indian Americans came to dominate this industry makes us more than just a simple story about an immigrant group achieving the American dream. The hotel was uh, my dream from back in the country. Hashar Patel came to the United States in 1981 from the state of Gujarat in India with his family and a dream to own hotels. His first was in Flushing, Queens. It was very hard. It was a new venture. The first hotel, my daughters helped me. Both daughters, they helped me. They were working as a desk clerk. Uh, my wife helped me out to clean the rooms. The whole family, my brother's son, they helped me out, my sister's daughter, they helped me out. He now directly and indirectly owns 10 hotels in the New York area, including this Holiday Inn Express in Masspath, New York. He credits his success to his family and the greater Gujarati community. One of my friends from India, he helped me out, and with him, there are another four or five people, they joined with me. So at that time, we five, six people get together and we bought the property. Over time, Patel slowly bought out his investors, but he says without them, he would not be standing where he is today. I might have done it, but it might take so long time. Maybe I was owning one hotel right now without those people. His road to success is commonplace within this ethnic group. And if you ever thought that there are a lot of Indian Americans who own and operate hotels, it's not your imagination. Indians own approximately half of the motels in the country. It could be the largest ethnic enterprise in our nation's history. Tufts University professor Pavan Dingra wrote a book called Life Behind the Lobby, Indian American Motel Owners and the American Dream. It explores how this immigrant population thrived in this multi-billion dollar industry. There's a lot of respect for uh, Indian motel owners among the broader Indian community because you have to recognize the fact that this is an immigrant population that came with not a lot of finances or uh, connections uh, and really have come to dominate a major sector of the American economy. 
A 2015 study of the industry showed that Indian American owned hotels are worth about $128 billion in value. And 70% of these hotels are owned by Patels, which earned it the nickname Patel Hotel, or Potel for short. As with any business, it's all about who you know. But it's particularly true in this case, where families, friends, acquaintances, and even having the common threat of being Indian has helped motel and hotel operators rise to the top of the pyramid. They come to the U.S. with that kind of linkage already in place, and they go straight to that person's motel, and they work there, get the experience, get some assets, get more money from friends and relatives across the country, uh, and, or even internationally, and then they themselves purchase a property. Until the mid-1940s, it was extremely difficult for Indians to even come to this country, let alone own businesses or real estate. But then their luck changed, thanks to several factors. The Immigration Law of 1946 uh, was one of the first laws to break down slowly the ban on Asian immigrants from the 1920s. It did allow you know, Indians to migrate, and some of those who did were those uh, pioneers, as they're called, in the motel industry, these Gujaratis, who came over. This first wave of Indians came as seasonal farm laborers, mostly to the San Francisco area. In the off-season, they would look for work in the city while staying at residential hotels. Some of these uh, seasonal laborers who had migrated from Gujarat you know, stayed at this place, realized that, you know, they themselves, they pulled their assets, could run one, uh, and there were those who were looking to sell. And those looking to sell were none other than the Japanese Americans, who at the time were living in internment camps. Properties were available to buy, and these Indian owners, uh, future owners, were able to procure some. And so that got them a foothold in the industry in the 1940s and 50s, and then it kind of grew from there. So the Gujarati Indians were at the right place at the right time. Very first owners are referred to in an affectionate way as accidental moteliers. It was not, they were not looking for motels. Okay, Miss Smith, I have you here for one night, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Excluding a brief stint working at his friend's hotel in India, Patel also had zero experience in this field. But now, as an award-winning owner, he tries to pay it back by paying it forward. Definitely make sure that I can help any Indian wants to build a hotel, anybody wants to go into business, I help them financially. While it's indisputable that Indian Americans have come a long way, many owners say that racial discrimination is rampant in this industry. Some say they even went so far as to hire non-Indians to man the front desk simply to hide the fact that they were Indian owned. Unfortunately, they say this racism still exists today, particularly following the recent hate crimes against Indian Americans and 9-11. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. I'm Paul Lin. From coast to coast, there's a growing appetite for poke, a traditional Hawaiian dish made with raw fish. Plenty of places now are serving it on the East Coast and with great variety, but Sons of Thunder helped to put poke on the map here in New York. I don't think many people knew about poke back in October 2015, and it was a rough start. Uh, I think we were giving out samples on the street, and people were asking, what is this food? Is this sushi? And we are like, not really. It's a, it's a Hawaiian dish. And the New York Times came. And they wrote about us, and they called us the best poke shop in the city. And ever since then, it's just been a dream, you know. Um, people from all over the world seem to come here and want to try out our poke. And they keep it pretty simple. Just three kinds of seafood poke, including an ahi tuna bowl. It's the freshest tuna, cubed and marinated, in the restaurant's own shoyu sauce, which combines soy sauce, sesame oil, and ginger, along with onions and seaweed. It's the only marinade used. And we will mix that with the fish and the sauce, and we offer a spicy mayonnaise if they like it spicy. We also serve vegetarian um, 
options such as tofu, golden beets. It's a very simple poke, but it seems to translate well over all the different fishes we serve, like salmon and octopus. This keeps the food in touch with its origins and the focus on quality fish, and the taste reminiscent of what the brothers remembered growing up. Our grandparents and our parents immigrated through Hawaii, through the West Coast, and we grew up here in New York City, though. Uh, we enjoyed poke as young children as well, and different interpretations of it. Our dream was always to have a restaurant and a place where we can serve people good food, food that we would eat at home. In Hawaii, poke is really just the marinated fish, maybe a side dish. At Sons of Thunder, poke is a meal in a bowl. We have our poke, we have your choice of rice, white, brown. We even do a lemon cauliflower rice for uh, non-carb eaters. And then we put some greens in there, and then you can add an assortment of different uh, toppings. So I don't think we, you would find the bowl, so to speak, in Hawaii, but that's how we serve it here in New York. Poke in Hawaiian means to slice or cut. Native Hawaiians caught fish, chopped it, and added simple seasonings like seaweed, crushed roasted local nuts, and salt. Experts believe the origins of the dish may be at least many centuries old. And as Polynesians, Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese migrated to the islands, they helped evolve the taste of poke, Hawaii's beloved dish. The dish that we know now that is so popular already in itself is kind of an amalgamation of influences. It didn't come from just one ethnicity. With poke's deep and diverse cultural roots, it's no wonder the dish is so loved in Hawaii. We eat it all the time <laughs> and everywhere. And so for like potlucks, special gatherings, from weddings to birthdays. But how did poke go from island comfort food to trending in the rest of the U.S.? Interest in good-for-you food like popular grain bowls may have set the stage for appreciation of poke in the U.S. Just top with poke. The dish has shown up on 54% more menus in recent years at restaurants that don't specialize in poke. Meanwhile, we're seeing a surge in Hawaiian restaurants in the U.S. Foursquare data show them nearly doubling in just two years. In New York City alone, there's more than 50 poke specialists now, John says. I believe the operational process is not a very difficult one, as opposed to cooking a variety of different meals. Preparation is a little bit simpler. You obtain fresh fish, you cut the fish, and you mix ingredients. To find out what inspired the poke phenomenon, you have to go back to the original from Hawaii. Martha sees three basic styles. Limu poke, flavored with seaweed and roasted crushed kukui nuts called inamona. Shoyu ahi poke with soy sauce, sesame oil, and onions and spicy mayo poke with mayonnaise, masago, a kind of fish egg, and something spicy like sriracha. Her new book, The Poke Cookbook, has traditional recipes as well as some innovations that may change what you think about this dish. Yeah, I think I honestly may have stretched the definition of poke a little bit, but in itself, poke means to chop, slice, so it's almost like I took that as the framework, but as much as possible, tried to make the flavors tied to Hawaii. Including a beet and macadamia nut poke in which the beets resemble cubes of tuna and other innovative preparations that still recall the islands. There's one that's a kind of Moroccan blackened ahi with preserved lemon. So crack seed lemon peel is really popular here, which is kind of like this dry, salty lemon peel that we eat as candy, um, which also has Chinese origins. So what about expansion plans for Sons of Thunder? Whatever does come next, John says needs a lasting business culture whereby the owners ensure that subsequent locations look out for their employees to foster growth and opportunities. That care and responsibility all benefits the customer. We feel like if we take care of our people, the business will take care of itself in the sense that the workers will take care of the customers because they're happy to be here, they're happy to work here, and I think customers can tell. And what about the surging number of poke restaurants in the U.S.? Can the market sustain, for example, a $20 poke bowl? One might ask, is poke a fad that will fade? It's not like a crow nut, say, that doesn't have that history, which could disappear in a couple years, and it's not like someone's tradition would be missing. So poke will always exist. 
Poke, the beloved Hawaiian dish with so much history, so many influences and fans, it's sure to stick around. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. Food bloggers are dishing up the latest in food news and trends, and some of the most influential bloggers just happen to be Asian American. Here's more. Hashtag foodie, hashtag nom nom, hashtag food porn. Are you like me and thousands of others who are obsessed with food on Instagram? Cascading noodles, melting ice cream, juicy burgers, mouth-watering dumplings. The top Instagram hashtag food had 182 million posts in 2016. That's a lot of food photos. And while most of us are just posting photos for fun, do you like my photo of pork buns from the famous dim sum restaurant, Tim Ho Wan? Many have turned a snapshot into a lifestyle. I think we just kind of, the people who are like myself who are passionate about food, you know, we go out, we take pictures of food that we like to eat, and we help promote the restaurants. And for me, it's a passion. Meet Ben Han, better known as Stuff Ben Eats. Ben joins a growing list of Asian American food bloggers who are literally eating their way to the top of the food influencer list. And hovering at the top of that list is Christine Yi of CY Eats. I think Asians, like they all have the same culture and they grew up in this very uh, family oriented environment where a lot of like their events and family occasions like centered around food. And I don't know an Asian who doesn't love food, so... <laughs> Yi is what's known as an elite foodstagrammer, which according to the website Thrillist means you have more than 100,000 followers. Christine has 168,000 and counting. Love them or hate them, snapping photos of food and posting on Instagram is one of the most popular uploads on the social media sharing site. There are no stats on the number of food bloggers on Instagram, but there are stats on the top foods that are posted. Pizza is number one, but close behind is sushi, with 13.5 million photos posted in 2016. Ramen and noodles also made the top 20 list. When Christine decided to focus solely on food, she went from 10,000 followers to 100,000 in one year. Not bad for this Johns Hopkins grad who worked in finance. I quit my job. I also got a divorce. <laughs> and my girlfriend was sitting with me and she's like, what are you going to do? Like, and I just want to be happy. I really want to just eat well and enjoy life. She's like, you should Instagram. Ben, meanwhile, grew up in New Jersey where his mom owned a restaurant. When I was a little kid, my mother would bring me to the restaurant every day. I, you know, there was no babysitter. Um, basically, I would sleep in the back by the, <laughs> where all the supplies were in a little cot or on top of the freezer with a little mattress. And, um, you know, ever since I was a little kid growing up through college, you know, I was in the restaurant uh, just helping out and kind of being surrounded by that environment. Both agree that food bloggers have changed the restaurant game, helping small business owners, including Asian American entrepreneurs who can't afford expensive marketing campaigns. And because Ben grew up in the small restaurant business, he hopes to help fledgling owners, including Jimmy Vo of the new Vietnamese restaurant, Madame Vo, in the East Village. I think Instagram has changed it a lot. Um, I, right now, I think it's the most powerful tool for marketing, you know, in terms of brand awareness and also getting a restaurant's name out to the public. I think it's very, very powerful these days. I have about two million impressions a week, and I reach about 750,000 unique accounts every week. So when you're reaching that many different people, people want to take advantage of that, and brands want to take advantage of that. So I think that's kind of just, it start, every advertising is moving into that, in, in that direction. Both are officially influencers, and they say their inboxes are filled with invitations to restaurant openings. Influencers can put restaurants on the foodie map and vice versa. It was this photo of two Taiyaki fish ice cream cones that got Ben noticed. Soon after, the website Refinery29 named him one of the Instagram food bloggers to follow in 2017. I think my favorite food to shoot is uh, probably noodles. Just, you know, they're beautiful in the bowl by itself without doing anything to it. You know, especially if the toppings are really colorful or, you know, you can kind of play around with it and, and lift up the noodles to kind of create this beautiful waterfall effect with the noodles or just kind of make it messy like a bowl of pasta and just kind of have it like look like it's kind of messed into and 
There's so many fun things you can do with noodles. So you're going to show me how to do so, yeah, so this you, is what, so you, what this is this is called? Uh, lifting noodles. So you would kind of grab like some meat, go in from the bottom and just kind of you know, oh. just do a little, little, little lift. Yeah. Get whatever noodles you can. You know, uh, these noodles are a little thinner and a little shorter, so it's a little tough to do a, a long noodle pull, but you can just do a little bit, like a, a little just baby, a show, a baby one, yeah. Right. Just to show That's the texture of the followers. noodles. <laughs> exactly, show the, show the texture of the noodles, right. the meat, and then, you know, we can take a photo like that. Christine, meanwhile, loves taking photos of dumplings and pasta. This photo alone got 16,300 likes and more than 200 comments. And this video of Bread Bakery's Nutella Bubka got more than 1 million views and 2,000 plus comments. This is why she's called an elite food Instagrammer. So how do you tell your traditional Korean mom that taking photos of food is now your full-time job? I've never been happier in my entire life. My mom was so stressed out when I started to do this. She's like, when are you getting a job? She's like, mom, this is my job. She's like, no, when are you getting a real job? It's like, oh, this is my job, mom. And I was telling my mom, I was like, mom, I just want you to know, I've never been this poor in my entire life, but I've also never been this happy. And she started to cry, and it made me so happy just because she was finally okay with it. She was coming to peace with it. And I'm going to start to cry now. So. <laughs> Um, but it was just so sweet, and it made me like feel better that she was cool with it. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. And stop by the Cranford Rose Garden here at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. Thanks for watching. <laughs>